Hello there, this is Agri Talk right here on KTN Farmers TV. And today we'll be talking about gender data and women in agriculture and trying to see how we can demystify the challenges that women are going through in agriculture. Now we have today uh, Mumbi Mugo, who is the program's officer at Hivos East Africa, and she's here to just talk to us more about this. My name is Kelvin Yakundi, and let's start this. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Kevin. How are you? It's always a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm fine. Thank you. How are you? I'm very fine. Nice Tell us um, a little bit about yourself. Okay. And then now we'll get to Hivos East Africa and then we hear what um, you guys are doing for us. Okay. Thank you. My name is Mombi Mogo. I work at Hivos East Africa as a program officer for a new program that we are just about to launch called Rural Women Cultivating Change. So it's all about rural women and what we can do better for them, how we can empower them, how we can improve their economic livelihoods. So it's a f fantastic project uh, mm -hmm. that we cannot wait um, to see how it, it, it unfolds and how it improves the lives of rural women. Um, other than that, I'm a lawyer by profession. Um, yeah, I think that's all about me. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Uh, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Now, let us just start. Uh, what is HIVOS East Africa and what do you um, do? Okay, so HIVAS East Africa is an international development organization okay. um, that basically helps to put right holders on the development table. And we do this by helping marginalized um, uh, right, rights holders to find their voice and to live a life of their choice. So we have different uh, thematic areas. We have um, a thematic area that we call JEDI, which is Gender Equality, Diversity and Inclusion. We are also working in civic rights and in the digital age, and we are also doing work around climate change. So mm -hmm. we have different um, hubs. I work in the Eastern African hub that is based in Nairobi. We have another hub in Southern Africa called um, Hibo Southern Africa. Uh, and our mother office is in the Netherlands, um, in, the, in, the, in the Netherlands. So I would say we are a Dutch organization, but we have two African hubs. Um, so he was East Africa and he was Southern Africa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So um, one of your programs, I believe, is um, trying to make sure that you take care of the rural woman mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. agriculture. Mm -hmm. How did this start for you? Um, I think what he was has done um, is looking at the rights of marginalized citizens or um, Kenyans. Um, we have looked at, we have had different projects uh, that have focused on um, empowering the rural woman. Uh, and I would speak to two of them uh, where I have been involved in. One is the one that we are going to be talking about a lot in this, pro in, in this uh, program today called Rural Women Cultivating Change that is basically very new. But we also had another one that was called Empower at Scale that was looking at empowering what we were calling the girls methodology, the gender action learning system, which is a household methodology that helps um, to, to, empower, to empower rural people or to empower rural women from that household level. Um, and what we did, we, we empowered rural women by making sure that they drew their vision journeys uh, so what the girls uh, methodology does, it helps people or it helps the rural people to look at the vision they have for their lives, um, where they want to be in a few years mm -hmm. um, or in a certain period of time where they want to be um, economically, uh, how they want to be empowered, what it will take for them to get there, what are the challenges. So once they have drawn, it's very, it's, it's very, it's very interesting how it happens. And what we have seen, because the project is now coming to an end, it has empowered a lot of women. One woman um, had, for example, one cow. By the time they wrote their vision and said, I want to be a, a dairy farmer by the end of this project, or in two years, I want to be a dairy farmer, or I want to have uh, two more cows uh, in a year. And then they draw that vision. So that household methodology, we were scaling it up um, to see that if, you know, we are able to reach more, more women through mm -hmm. that. So I would say that is one of the, of the projects that have really uh, been successful for Hebrews. We have had a lot of good results. Um, we have seen really rural women grow um, from one cow to five cows, from an ordinary woman to a dairy farmer, for instance. We have had people who are now moving from um, semi, um, what are they called? 
uh, you know, from like mud, mud houses to semi-permanent houses. Mm -hmm. So we have seen that. And what we are really trying to do as Hibos is to ensure that we give power back to the people. We ensure that we bring even the most remote areas to the development table, that we empower these women to have economic um, empowerment and to empower their livelihoods and their children and to bring them to the to the table. So I would I would say that is one of the projects that was very successful and we have seen how it has transformed the lives of rural women. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously now the project that we are about to launch, uh, the Rural Women Cultivating Change, is also going to be a game changer. Mm -hmm. uh, we are looking to see how we can um, also bring government closer to understanding the real issues or the lived realities of rural women and how we can mainstream policy with the correct data and with the correct information about what really happens in those rural areas and what exactly are the issues that the rural women, mm -hmm. um, farmers mm -hmm. specifically, face. So that we, we then use that information and that knowledge to um, influence agricultural policy. All right. Yeah. And um, in the first projects that you had, um, the one that you've really um, spoken about yeah. and said maybe uh, you, you you saw one woman mm. having one cow, mm. and then at the end of the uh, at the end of it, mm. you find maybe she has five cows. Mm. So, um, w what would be some of the maybe um, challenges that you faced at um, the first project mm. that you may, you say in the next project mm. you are going to try and correct? Um, yeah, and I think these challenges cut across. I mean, when you are talking about empowering the rural women, mm -hmm. especially in agriculture, there are, ch there are challenges that really never seem to go away. Of course, the biggest challenge is the issue of land. Mm -hmm. um, and the second biggest challenge, especially with that project, is that women at that level, at the household level, are not decision makers. They have very, very limited influence on decision making at the family level. Um, and which is why this project was going to the household level to try and influence um, decision making from that point. So this is where you talk to the head of the household who is the man and, and, and you, know, you are having conversations, for example, about the responsibilities and duties of this woman. I like to give this example mm -hmm. um, that I, 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 had, I had once from, from a colleague of mine who had done this before me. Um, that, you know, with this methodology, what we call the girls' methodology, uh, you really go to the household. And for the first time, it sort of opens the man's eyes onto the responsibilities that the woman has been handling. Mm -hmm. So, um, they, 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 you know, when, and, they, and he was telling me that, you know, once we, once we were able to have this conversation with this man, it is 6 o'clock in the morning, the wife wakes up before the man, all right? So it's just an ordinary day. They are about to, to, to go about their duties, and one of the biggest duties in the rural areas is, is either tending to cows mm. or farming. And usually they begin with tending to cows in the morning, and then they go to the shamba. So the woman wakes up fast, probably 6 a.m. in the morning, um, and then tends to the husband mm -hmm. and the children. And then when it is time to go to the shamba, so the woman carries the man's jembe and her jembe, and a baby, and a kiondo mm. that has food. Yes. Uh, and then they go down, probably as the man is pocketing, right? Yes. So they go down. So I always imagine in my head, it's in my rural area in Nyeri, where the land is steepy and <laughs> slopy, right? Yes. Uh, so uh, I imagine the woman going down, and at the bottom of the shamba, there is a river, right? So, um, uh, so they go down, and then they, they, they do the farming. When it's time to go back home, the woman now carries the jembe, her jembe, mm -hmm. the man's jembe, right? The child, probably water from the stream, mm -hmm. and probably um, some kiondo. pumpkin leaves or sweet potatoes mm -hmm. in the kiondo, mm -hmm. and goes back home, right? And when she goes back home, she's not going to rest. She's going now to start preparing food. Uh, maybe lunch or dinner yes. and taking care of the children and probably the other children have come from school. Mm. Probably it's time to milk now. In the, it's in the evening. It's time to milk and take maybe the milk to the nearest um, uh, where they sell milk. So with this methodology, you are really able to see the true um, definition or the true reality of what happens in that household. 
And you will see that this woman obviously does most of the farming mm. and has so many responsibilities, but she's also very poor. She has no control over finances in that home. Mm. She has no decision-making voice. Uh, but then you will see that she's really burdened with, um, with extra work that is, of course, unpaid. So what this methodology did teach us and, and what we saw is that you cannot achieve gender equality without the men. And you have to show the men um, or you have to really bring the men to the table and closer to this conversation for them to be able to see the true reality of what happens in women's lives. So that was one huge um, uh, challenge for men. And um, that program was not just focusing on, on women. Mm. We, had, um, we had men and women. We were calling them girls champions. And what we wanted of them is to see that you have come from this level as a rural citizen yes. uh, living. So we, we did this in, in Meru and Makweni. Mm. So we wanted to see that you have come from this point uh, and you have reached another skill. So we were doing this to eradicate poverty. Um, and to really empower them uh, economically mm. and to ensure that they had a sense of, of, of economic empowerment. And we did see a lot of results by going to this household to influence change and attitudes at that level. Mm -hmm. yeah. And now, um, in, in your second project now, yeah. for, uh, because you've explained the mm. first one and mm. the, the main challenge, you mm. say, was to reach the man mm. in the house. Mm. Now, in the second project, um, how have you made, do you have any ways that you can say, now this is how we are going to reach the man? Mm. Because there are people in the village mm. who wouldn't want even to hear mm. um, that they need, there are some men in the village mm. who would say, this is the work of the woman. Yeah. Why would I come in yeah. and uh, do the work of the woman? Yeah. So in the second project, how are yeah. you going to deal with this? Let me give you a very practical example. Mm -hmm. um, there is this, project, not, not by Hebos, uh, where they were trying to have um, people use energy-saving jikos, mm -hmm. right? So, um, but the man, when he goes to the market or when he passes by a market, he doesn't relate to a jiko, so he won't buy it, right? Because he, it, is not, it is not in his domain yes right and mm. i and i think that's what you're asking um so how do we bring them closer um what this project is doing it's called rural women cultivating change so it's primarily focusing on the woman but like i said before if we want the men to also be part of of of, of, of this conversation for example yes. in, in that jiko situation the man is also a part of this conversation if we show him why it is important from the beginning um, why it is important to save energy, why it is important to use clean energy to cook, we must show him how it affects him in the long run. So when the man has seen that this is also about me and the success of this, this is how it is affecting me. This is how it is reducing poverty. This is how it is um, improving my children's um, welfare. And for men, a lot of them is just about money. Um, what is the economic trans translation for this or the financial translation for this to me as a person. So um, we cannot win the war around um, gender equality without involving the men uh, because primarily we really must focus on both men and women. So our project, uh, the Rural Women Cultivating Change, will focus on how uh, we can improve the lives of rural women in farming, but also men. So we are focusing on young men, young women, as well as adult men and adult women. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, for example, um, the men, speaking, still speaking mm. on the men, yeah. uh, have you f uh, figured out a way in which, um, because some men yeah. still stick to the culture, yeah. do you have people on the ground mm. who you say, now we are going to use them to connect mm. to the people around mm. uh, the village. Let me tell you, we are working especially in, um, in very patriarchal communities, uh, pastoralist communities. We are working in Baringo, mm -hmm. for example, that is both uh, pastoralist and also very patriarchal. We are working in Laikipia, we are working in uh, Kitui, we are working in um, Nakuru. Uh, in the projects, we also have uh, our friends and colleagues who are working in Tanzania, and we have friends and colleagues who are working in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. And if you look 
at what connects Kenya, Tanzania, and Ethiopia in mm -hmm. this conversation. Those two countries are affected by climate change, right? Uh, those three countries are affected by climate change. Those three countries uh, have very patriarchal norms uh, and practices and cultural practices. And those three countries have very huge challenges around food security. Yes. Um, so what, what can we do to influence, um, um, you know, these practices and, and cultural barriers that we have that obviously inhibit women from becoming um, agricultural, um, productive in agriculture? Um, we are, of course, starting with a baseline that is going to help us really get to know what we are getting ourselves mm -hmm. into. Mm -hmm. So we are already in the ground interviewing people. Uh, we want to know what are some of the uh, of the of the cultural inhibitions um, or that that we are expecting to find. Um, but of course, we did our research in the beginning, and what we can do is really not to separate the conversation. But we cannot separate the conversation around men and women. Mm -hmm. So that is one of the things we will do, and then we will ensure that in every meeting we have men. We have women, uh, but we are also our, our, a lot of our focus in this project is on female-headed households. That's how you increase the voice of women. Because if you go to just any household, the head of that household is a man, and if you talk to the men more often, you'll never get the true picture of what is happening um, with women. And obvi obviously, these women farm more they are they they con they make up um, a huge percentage of the farmers so um, i would say that what we are doing we are not going to separate the conversation uh, to say that this we will still involve the men uh, to make sure there is also um you know that that balance mm -hmm. we, will, we will try our best to strike it mm -hmm. and now um across kenya um you, you are across kenya you're yeah. doing this across uh, the yeah. country where would you say is um, the problem more than the other place? Um, I think if you look at the pastoralist um, communities, yes. uh, right from northeastern coming down uh, that area, Baringo, um, those places have a double tragedy. Uh, one, they are seriously affected now by climate change yes they are seriously affected by food security food insecurity they are also seriously affected by patriarchal norms and 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 you know cultural practices that have over the years over the years because this is not a story of yesterday over mm. the years um contributed to gender inequality and inhibited women's progress in many areas of their lives, uh, not just in agriculture, in leadership, for example. Um, you will see that in those areas, and we're talking about rural areas, right? Yes. You will see that we do have CBOs, for instance, but those CBOs are male-led to date. Mm. Uh, you will still see in those areas we still have issues of early marriages and FGM. They have, they are still there. Mm. So I would say, um, um, and it's not, it's not an issue of comparison uh, because the issue of food insecurity is bad everywhere. But I would say, uh, from what I have seen personally, uh, those 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 areas, the semi-arid areas, have, um, you know, they have, they face that uh, dynamic, uh, food insecurity. Um, then we have those cultural practices, very retrogressive cultural practices. And then we also now have the conversation around climate change and how they can adapt. That that has been significant. Just the other day, I think towards the, the end of last year, the mm. president announced drought in those areas, a, yes. national, a, a national disaster. Mm. So, yeah, you can imagine. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what can be done in order to try and correct this? Because you find that these communities, mm. the women are really mm. put down there mm. they don't uh, make decisions mm. so what do you think can be done in order to correct this because as we move forward mm. um systems are changing things um the climate is is affecting almost mm. every mm. every place mm. so you as hevos mm. east africa what do you think can be done in order to correct this um do you know that in those communities, uh, especially the, the pastoralist communities, women have a say on small livestock or small animals. <laughs> and the men have a say in the big animals, like the cows, and then mm. the women manage chickens, 
and then the men manage cows, camels. Um, and then you will see that women manage f seeds because seed is also another big issue um, in food, food, food security, seed entrepreneurship. If you look at those communities, women manage just food collection, mm -hmm. seed collection mm -hmm. and seed storage, but the men manage the seeds, they control the seeds where these will be planted. If you look at those uh, communities as well, you will see that women manage subsistence farming. So they only manage the crops that are for family use. Mm. And you'll see that the men then manage cash crops. Um, what can we do yes. uh, for this, for this, for this woman? Um, and what the project is going to do is to really try and empower this woman um, for example, to take up leadership positions. If we had more women take up leadership positions at that rural level, talking about cattle deep, leadership of the cattle deep community yes. in your village. Mm. I don't know if you have that in your village. We, <laughs> we have do, we <laughs> do. Yes. <laughs> we do. That is male-led. Yes. We do have farmer organizations at that level that are male-led, mm. right? We do have, um, we, mm. we have CBOs at that level that discuss farmers' issues and agricultural practices at the village level, but they are male-led. So what will happen is that at the end of the day, we will never have women take up these positions. We will never be able to address these issues from a woman's perspective or from a gender uh, perspective. So one of the things we want to do is, number one, is empower women to take up leadership positions in farmer-led organizations at the rural level. Not just organizations, but also associations. There yes. are so many associations, there are CBOs, you know, those things, cattle dips. Um, we want women to be at the forefront. If you empower women to take leadership positions, then we have more... Um, issues uh, or we have people really talking about the realities of women at that level mm -hmm. the other thing we want to do um apart from um asking women to take up leadership positions for that is also the issue of sexual um gender-based violence because it is rampant in agriculture yes uh, we want to see how we can um, empower response both uh, at the policy level and also at that level talking about markets in the rural areas uh, where women have gone to, to take their produce. And, you know, there is a lot of um, sexual harassment that happens, SGBV cases, uh, because these women, you, I have to really sell my produce, but then it's the men who run these markets. It's the men who know where these things should be sold. So we also have that aspect. And, of course, the third issue is just to do women know really that they have rights, what are, they, what are the rights of mm. women farmers? Do mm -hmm. they exist? Uh, do women know that there's a constitution that, that, that protects them? Do they know, um, for example, redress mechanisms? If we are not getting this, do we know where to report? Uh, do we know who our extension, our, our agricultural extension officers at our counties? Mm. Do we know them? Mm. Do we know how we can reach them? Um, so we will be looking at those issues, empowering women around those three dynamics that I have talked about, but also connecting this to the policymakers and really, um, really trying to find out what are the existing policy gaps that we have that are really um, are disempowering women mm -hmm. at, at that level mm -hmm. and what can we do. So I know it's going to be interesting. Uh, we have a few researches that we have commissioned. Um, we are talking to women to just understand the dimensions and the dynamics in this, um, in this, in this, in this sector. Uh, and I know that we are really going to, to be able to change a few narratives. All right, we have to go for a short break. Okay. We'll, we'll come back with that policy gaps so that we, we look at it more. Mm. All right, we have to go for a short break. Remember, we are here with Mumbi to just discuss about the new project that Hivos East Africa has um, in order to make sure that women in agriculture are included even in the rural areas so that we have a good um, result at the end where, where everyone is included in this. My name is Kelvin Yakundi. Don't go too far. We'll be back with more.
Welcome back. This is AgriTalk, and today we are talking to Mumbi, who is the programs officer at Hivos East Africa, and we are talking about the role of women in agriculture and how they have come up with a project to help the rural woman uh, to be included in agriculture. Welcome. Thank you. So um, now let's look at gender data. Yeah. What is it exactly? Um, and I think this interview wouldn't have come at a better time. March is always a fantastic month to talk about issues of data and women. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, but you will also agree with me, Kevin, that um, agriculture is becoming feminized. We have um, men, a lot of men now moving away from the rural areas to pursue um, employment opportunities in the cities mm -hmm. and what then this means is that we have a lot more women who are left in the rural areas to pursue agricultural um, activities so if agriculture is becoming feminized it's then not business as usual mm. we therefore must ensure that we change our policies to suit the needs of women in agriculture because they are not the same. The needs of men and women in agriculture are completely different as we talked about uh, before we went for break. Um, and so how do we then get to change these policies with what information? Mm. And that is where the issue of data becomes um, important. And you know, as they say now that data is the gold of the 21st century, basically there's nothing we can do without without data. Yes. Otherwise, everything else we talk about without um, evidence is just theories. Mm. So the issue of gender data, especially in agriculture, because that's what we're talking about today, um, is, is useful in, in ensuring one um, that the issues of women that we looked about that that we talked about uh, before we went for break are addressed, and we have policies that really look at the needs of women and try to address this. So, what is gender data? So, gender data is data that is disaggregated by sex, male and female. Mm -hmm. However, it goes further to look at the dis disparities across men and women. It also goes further to propose or to recommend actionable policy um, actions that can be taken to address, um, to address those disparities. Yes. And you will see that a lot of the gender, or a lot of the data that is available now, especially in the area of agriculture, is very imbalanced. Mm. And it's very ambiguous. Because we are talking about all these challenges that are facing women farmers in our communities, in our countries, in Africa. Mm -hmm. But we do not really paint a clear picture of the complexity of this situation. We really do not paint a picture of the reality that is lived by these women. And the only way we can do that is, is by having gender data mm -hmm. or by, uh, by ensuring that our researches are gendered. Mm -hmm. So if you look at what has been happening and how this data has been collected in the past, conventional surveys have been using household um, surveys and when you go to a household and then you want to talk to the head of the household and the head of the household is a man but actually the women do the farming so if you are going to get the challenges that really affect women in farming talk to the women but if you go to a household and you talk to the head of the household who is a man and you're collecting data uh, on challenges uh, facing farmers mm. or women farmers, uh, then you'll not have the correct data. In these households, we looked at that and we saw that women do not have uh, decision-making powers. Um, they don't have any say uh, over land. For example, they have no control over land. They have no control. They have no access to land. It is the man who says, we are planting this here. Mm. No, we cannot plant. The women have absolutely no say. They have absolutely no decision-making powers. Uh, so when you go to a household and you talk to the head of the household who is a man, you'll definitely get biased data, mm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, that is what has been happening. So what we have currently is data that does not really look at the true, uh, or the data that does not really paint the reality of the rural woman and the reality of the challenges that we have with women farmers or mm. the women farmers are facing. So therefore, we cannot then say that if we use this data, 
to uh, influence agricultural policy, then, then the policies at the end of the day will favor women because they will not. Yes. Yeah. And um, s still on the data, in the rural areas, yeah. I believe um, the data that has been taken might not have covered every a single person in mm. the rural areas. Mm. So what are some of the ways that um, you are coming in in order to just seal this gap and make sure that every, almost everyone mm. is covered? Mm. Because the data that, as you've said, the mm. data is scanty. It's mm. not very clear. Mm. So what are some of the ways that you're coming up with in order to seal this? Mm. Mm. Um, I think issue number one is creating a lot of visibility around um, sex disaggregated data. Mm -hmm. uh, that has not been happening. Uh, number two is also ensuring and empowering women to really bring them to the decision-making table, as well as working with researchers, people who really uh, collect this data, uh, to look at their tools. Uh, because when you go to a household, you're not just going to talk to the, you know, it's not just about talking and, and just ticking boxes. Mm. I think when you go to a household, for example, in a rural area, and you are really interested in getting gendered data, you talk to both the, the woman mm. and the man. When you go to that household, you will be interested in knowing who does what because there is a division of, of labor and chores in, in the, at the household level. So you'll be interested to know who does what. You will also be interested to know who makes financial decisions in this yes. household. Yes. Most of the time it's the man. Mm. But then you'll be interested to know whether there is any consultation. When you go into that household, you will be interested in knowing, for example, the knowledge around agriculture, because you realize that men have um, more knowledge than women. Knowledge around these things is also is is different based based on the gender. So um, and, and 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 you know I attended a conference last year and and really rural women came out to really talk to researchers that when you're doing your research and when you're collecting this data, you are not representing us. The voice of the woman is being unheard. Mm. There is uh, another who wrote, I think her name is Carolyn Derez or something like that. She, she really did say that we have a lot of invisible women mm. because their voices are not heard, they're not documented. So we know women exist, but they're invisible. We know women farmers exist, but they're invisible. Because if the data about them and about the challenges that they are facing is not out there, yes. we don't know them, mm -hmm. we have not had them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, So we don't know they exist, they are truly invisible. So it's also about um, organizations and researchers ensuring that they have the correct tools, um, that they have um, data that, uh, that is not biased because then we use that data to inform a lot of policies and to, in, um, to also inform a lot of, um, a lot of progress mm -hmm. uh, around issues of women. Mm -hmm. So I think those for now are, are what we are really looking at and we are very keen in, in our new project, yeah. All right, and this woman, a smallholder farmer, mm. how can she be supported mm. in agricultural systems? Mm. Mm. Um, this smallholder, woman farmer. Actually, rural. Rural. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Rural woman farmer. Mm -hmm. They have to understand the agricultural value chain. And then they have to see, or we have to really empower them and see where they come in in this value chain, yes. right from, from, from the home, right from owning or accessing land, because that is a huge challenge um, for women. Mm. Um, even in this country, but yes. if you go to, uh, for example, Western um, and I think Eastern counties, mm. you will see that there are a lot of uh, disinheritance, for example, mm. uh, inheritance issues. Women really do not have, they don't own land. Um, and they, they don't also have control over it and access to it. They have to access the land through men. So either through a husband, a brother, a brother-in-law, mm. we have a lot of cases in courts where women uh, are, are, are really, uh, you know, caught up in the, in, in the conversation between in-laws or in the battle for land with, with in-laws. So issues of, of land is, is big for women. Um, issues of leadership, uh, I think we talked about this, women taking up, uh, rural women taking up leadership in rural 
rural farmer-led organizations or associations because that is the only way then you know they're able to streamline not really voice yes. and their voices to be heard mm -hmm. um another thing how can we empower them inputs women do not have access to inputs they don't have access to fertilizers they don't have access to pesticides they don't have access to modern tools for example uh, and that's a conversation for another day where we are going to look at how modern technology is also affecting the rural woman farmer mm. who can't drive a tractor or control exactly. mm. operators. And then we have all this modern technology. That's, that's for another day. Mm. Um, so we really have to look at those challenges. Um, land, we have said, we have talked about inputs. We have talked about leadership. Um, and then how do we now bring the woman to the decision-making table? Um, and I think that's the sole purpose of this project. We're going to be doing this for the next five years. Mm. Um, making the rural woman who is a farmer to be heard, to be aware of their rights, uh, to be aware of the redress mechanisms that exist, such that if my right in this area is violated, this is where I can go. This, these are, this is what the law will do for me, and this is what the law says about these issues. The biggest thing also is women don't have information. Yes. They don't have information about, um, about for example, financial services. Um, although now, if you don't have land and the bank wants your land as collateral, yes. you know, you see mm. women, they really, um, uh, they, are, they are at a bad place. So we, we, we really want to empower them with the information, one, on, on, um, on, on, the, on, the, on how the law protects them on availability of, of certain services that are near them. Uh, for example, the rural woman doesn't have this information. If you look at what the government has recently done with the reforms in the tea sector, uh, which was a very good initiative, fantastic initiative that has really um, helped tea farmers uh, to overcome challenges of many years. Um, uh, you, you will see initiatives like those exist uh, we have reforms, for example, in the tea sector. We have reforms in the in the sugarcane sector. Mm -hmm. We have uh, reforms in different sectors. But to what extent are women involved in these um, reforms? Because if you look at tea farming, for example, there are so many documentaries that have been going around. Around, it's a man's cash crop. So where is the voice of of women, even as 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 we celebrate? Uh, the different um, legal reforms that we have. For example, now we have the Tea Act, then we have all these uh, tea reforms that have been, that have come on board. Now we have better money uh, for tea farmers, but still, the voice of the woman is, is, is still unheard. And we really do not know how then these reforms translate to economic empowerment for women. Mm. Um, so it's just to really empower women and to really bring them to the decision-making table. Uh, and for example, when we are discussing all these bills and all these uh, legal reforms that we have, yes. um, all these policies that we are bringing on board and all these reforms that we are talking about is to also really bring the woman to the drafting table mm. and to say this is what I really would want to see and yes. then ensure that that is, is mainstreamed. So I would say um, for the general farmer, there are many initiatives that exist, there are policies that exist, of course we could do better, but does this ideally translate to the economic empowerment mm -hmm. for the woman? Mm -hmm. If we have all these reforms and we have all these laws, um, what does it mean for the woman? Do they know they exist? Do they know what they mean? Do they know where to get these services, for example? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now, um, you as HEVOs, going forward, you mentioned um, this second project that you have for yeah. the rural woman is going to run for like five years mm -hmm. or even more. Mm -hmm. So uh, just tell us, going forward, what we expect from you. Okay. Um, so this rural woman, uh, rural women cultivating change is yes. really about changing the narrative of rural women. It's about eradicating poverty with, uh, uh, by looking at, at the rural woman. Um, it's about empowering economic livelihoods for women through agriculture, for instance. It's about empowering women to take up leadership positions at that level. It's about really changing the narratives. You see, agriculture is associated with poverty in the rural areas. Even young people don't want to do it. Um, it's about changing some of those um, uh, narratives that have existed. 
it's about empowering that woman to, to rise up really and take and take charge of their lives. It's about empowering women, for example. Um, we have now a uh, constitution, um, and I don't think really rural women understand. We have had this constitution since 2010. Mm. Uh, but I don't think the rural woman really understands um, what the constitution says about about them, or how the constitution really protects gender equality, for instance, how the constitution uh, protects access to resources and natural resources management, for instance. Um, if you look at the statistics around the world, about a third mm -hmm. of the world's, um, a, a third of, of women globally are employed in agriculture. So this one includes fishing, forestry, and farming. Uh, and that's a huge uh, percentage. So what this project will do is to really make sure that women then benefit from agriculture. Because at, as it is, they do most of the farming, they do no selling. Mm. They don't have access to markets, they don't have access to inputs, they don't have access and control to land, um, they don't have uh, access to extension services, they don't have information, uh, and times are changing. Um, and so we really want to see how we can uh, change some of these attitudes, how we can have a paradigm shift uh, at the policy level, but also at the social level, mm -hmm. uh, looking at some of those uh, retrogressive cultural practices that we have that are really preventing women from reaping the benefit of their agricultural um, activities in the rural areas. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you one more before you give us your last uh, okay. remarks. All right, uh, for example, the constitution, you've mentioned the constitution. Mm -hmm. um, it, is it being broken down to the woman in the rural area so that they may understand what what their mm. role is? Mm. Um, I, um, I mentioned this um, in the issue of access to information. Yes. Uh, and you know, it's it's one thing for information to be out there, and it's another thing for for women or for rural people, for example, to understand what that information is about and how it affects them or how yes. it protects them mm. or how it translates um, to their usefulness. So the issue of access to information is also a big thing, uh, including breaking down some of these policies, um, good policies, some of these reforms into a language that they can understand yes. or into formats they can access, into formats they can understand and into formats they can relate with. If they don't relate, they will never give feedback to government, for example. So um, those, those opportunities exist, but they have no information about them. Uh, and I would say in this project, also one of the key things that we want to do is ensure there is access to information for the rural women, especially in agriculture, uh, to package that information in a format that they can relate to, in a format they can access, in a format they can understand in mm -hmm. their own language yes. so that they engage with it and they're able to give um, meaningful feedback, for example, to governments and to NGOs like Hibos, mm -hmm. for instance. Mm -hmm. um, that is still lacking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now your last remarks as we end this today. Um, thanks, Kevin, and it has been an absolute pleasure. Mm -hmm. um, I think my last remark would be um, going by the theme of this year's International Women's Day, which mm -hmm. is breaking the bias. I really would want to see um, a country where we break the bias, um, especially around gender data, uh, that when we go to collect data, we ensure that the data leads to the stereotypes and the, and the, and the bias against women. Yes. And so therefore we get data that really would help us to influence agricultural policy um, to favor women or to protect the rights of women. So I think we continue breaking the bias and uh, we continue empowering that rural woman. I think there are so many opportunities in agriculture uh, and I think women have done so much. Uh, they are producing about 75% of Africa's food, mm -hmm. uh, but then they are still the most poorest uh, and they still continue to face a lot of discrimination. Um, so I want to uh, hope that the future days are better for the rural women uh, and that we continue to involve them in the agricultural value chain mm -hmm. and we continue to uh, break it down for them on how they can engage with different stakeholders in different um, uh, value chains. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you so much for Thank joining you. us today, Mombi.
All right, uh, we have to finish there. We've been talking to Mumbi, who is a programs officer at Hivos East Africa, and she, she just explained a lot of things that are to do with women in agriculture and how the women can be supported in order to make sure that they contribute to the agriculture sector in the country and in turn just even the climate change. Mm -hmm. My name is Kelvin Yakundi and I hope you had a nice time today. Let's meet same time, same place. This is AgriTalk right here on KTN Farmers TV.